I'm going to give you an opportunity with that. For those of you who have your Bibles, you go to Daniel, the third chapter. We're going to continue um, in the book of Daniel. And today, I just want to say that I just, I really enjoyed worship today. I just felt like, man, I don't want this to end. I just want to sit here and cry. And just, man, like, this is great. And just the song, like, when you went into You Made A Way, I was thinking in my head, I hope they do that song next. I hope they do that song next. And I was like, because that would make really perfect sense for what we were singing. And so I was just like, man, that's really amazing they did that. And uh, I just want to say I'm happy today. And uh, it's not, it's not, you don't have to feel guilty about having joy or being happy. Just thought I'd share that with you. So today I want to talk to you about worship because guess what the enemy's after? The enemy has a longing, a deep longing to be worshipped. When he exalted himself above God, he went from the worship leader to the one desiring worship. So Satan's main objective for you is that you'd worship him. Now, we think of that, we think of bowing down to Mary um, or bowing down to some Hindu god with, you know, 26 arms. Uh, but the reality is we bow down to whatever we put before God. So in our culture, money is really the thing. Uh, success, popularity, um, all these image, all these things become something that contends for first place. And none of those things are necessarily bad in their proper place. But the battle is for our worship. And so it's going to become very clear and very evident. And remember with Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar sees this vision and he's really troubled by the vision. He sees a, a statue and the head is gold and then it goes down and becomes less valuable as, as it goes down, which is a, a picture of the system of the world and how the world operates. Things lose their value in the world. In the kingdom, things appreciate. In the world, things go down. I encourage you, if you're going to buy stuff, Consider buying things that appreciate. <laughs> um, that was free. But, but now the statue that has a head, gold, of head, gold head, silver here, bronze midsection, steel legs, and then as it goes down, it's clay and steel and ceramic, and it's not as quite as glorious as the top. So Nebuchadnezzar has this vision. He doesn't understand it. And he's deeply troubled. And that is the condition of many people, uh, not only in church, but outside of the church, who have genuine spiritual experiences, but don't have understanding. They feel in turmoil. My spiritual experience doesn't mean anything to you unless I have understanding. Understanding is how you can add value to others. Understanding is when I listen to you and I know what's going on in your life and I can say, make a right or press pause or speed up or slow down or I can encourage you because I understand where you are. I cannot encourage you or guide you if I don't understand, right? If I don't understand the scripture, I can't say anything of any value to you because my opinion doesn't actually mean anything. <laughs> like, the more we know that our opinion doesn't mean anything, the better we are and the happier we are. Because we carry this sense of ego when we think our opinion is the law of Moses. And it's not. And, and we, it's very easy to sacrifice my purpose for preference. And so you, you have to really be clear that it's not our opinions or feelings that really matter. It's what God is saying and what God has said and what he's doing that matters. So Daniel is the one who is able to interpret by the grace of God and through the gifting of God what is going on in Nebuchadnezzar's heart. And then he finds peace 
and Daniel gets promoted. But he does not really understand this experience. And I'll tell you why. Because he's going to show us that he doesn't understand what just happened. Right? Because he had a vision of a statue, didn't understand it, was troubled by it, and then went and made a statue. <laughs> Which is the end of him. It's the beginning of the end of him. That's what pride brings you to the beginning of the end of you. It'll bring you really, really low. Very low. Uh, <laughs> it's always better to go low and let God lift you up than try to exalt yourself and do the self thing because then the self thing, it will, you, will, you will meet a mighty hand that will really go... Whoosh. Not a good idea. I, trust me, I can tell you from experience. So, in Daniel 2, the king sees a statue with a golden head. In Daniel 3, he makes a fully gold statue to himself, of himself, and he puts it in a valley so everyone can see it. And it's 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. Can I tell you something about this, this man? Although he's very powerful... On the inside, he's small. Small people always want to attract people to themselves. Small people. Big people don't need that and don't do that. They don't care about that. That's how they became big. <laughs> they were bigger on the inside than they were on the outside. So this statue is showing us that this man is bankrupt on the inside. Okay? Now, he didn't respond correctly to the vision. It's possible to see something from God, but not respond correctly to it. This happens to us more than we would like to admit. God says something to us, God shows us something. We hear something on a podcast. A friend prays for us. And in the prayer, there's a phrase there for you. There, you know, in passing, there's a comment that's supposed to thrust you forward. And instead, it makes you feel, why would you say that to me? But it was for you, not against you. Do you know many times people mistake the people that are really for them as the ones that are against them? The people that are for you will say things that feel as if they're against you because they're actually for you. And the people that are really against you will say things that are for you when they're really against you. That's why feelings, feelings, feelings. You, you better learn to put your intellect over your feelings or your feelings will rule your, your, rule your life. Feelings are to enhance us, not to enslave us. So Nebuchadnezzar feels bankrupt, so he makes a statue to himself. Someone who is secure and powerful does not need people doing that. <laughs> just, just to let you know. Okay. Now, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold. Now, in his vision, only the head was gold. Remember that? Now, the whole image is gold, but that's not what he saw. Bankrupt people have to always inflate their image of themselves. One of the words for image is Astaroth. <laughs> Someone that reads their Bible knows what I'm saying. <laughs> Everyone's like, this is lunchtime. Astaroth, which was a which was a idol. So in our culture, be careful. I like to look cool and this and that, but listen, that's not the essence of who I am, and that's not the essence of who you are. So don't don't allow an image to lie to you. Be careful. Not everything that glitters is gold. So, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits, and it's with 6 cubits. I translated that to you for feet. 
he set up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon and the king Nebuchadnezzar sent a word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which king Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried out, To you it is commanded. So Nebuchadnezzar is not asking. He's telling. This is the culture that we live in. The culture is not asking you. The culture is telling you. And you need to have backbone and courage to stand up and say no. No. You, you tell someone no and you'll find out what they're really made of. I have a prophetic word. No, not for today. I want to preach. No, not today. I want to come on this trip. No. I want to do this. No. You, you tell someone no, and you'll find out what they're made of. Tell a child no, and watch. <laughs> See, that how you respond to a no... That is indicative, that shows your level of spiritual maturity. Do you know many times God tells us no for our own good? And we just want to go ahead and plow through it and just make it happen? I don't, I'm too old for that. I don't want that. Like if that no is going to save me problems, pain, interest, and all types of things, I'm like, I'm all good on the no. Because I'm, I'm not into paying more than I got to pay. I've already, we've already paid enough. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So then a happy a herald cried, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. So the music... The music is triggering the worship. That's why if you need music to worship, you're not a worshiper. You're going for therapy. That's why you have to learn how to sing in the spirit, not in the flesh. Worship, I don't need, Isaac, I love Isaac and Deborah. I don't need them to worship. I can worship all by myself. Now, I'd rather have them than not have them. But I don't need a violin to make me feel better. Now, does a violin make me feel better? Indeed, I married a violin to feel better. <laughs> One time Sarah played the violin for me while I ate. I felt like a, a king, you know, in my little, little two-bedroom apartment in Rutherford. But uh, anyhow, you know, God is good. So let's get back to the story here. <laughs> Whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of the burning fire. So Nebuchadnezzar is saying, get down or lay down. He's commanding worship and he's using music to trigger the worship. He's using music to cause people to surrender. I said something to my friend years ago. And I said, yo, are you gay? And he was definitely not gay. And he looked at me, he's like, yo, Pops, you know I'm not gay. He called me, my friends used to call me Pop. So he's like, Pops, you know I'm not gay. And I go, well, I wanted to ask you that because to me, what I'm seeing is sound, it's gay to me. He's like, what do you mean? I'm like, you're listening to Jay-Z, and he's telling you to lift your hands up and say his name. And I'm like, to me, that's gay. Because when you lift your hands up, you're surrendering. And you're screaming the name of a dude. That's gay to me. I just wanted to let you know that. And this was the most ungay person 
That's all I'm going to say. I'm just not going to say a lot. But listen, we got verification. No gayness. He probably never had a gay thought in his life. And he looked at me. And he was like, dang. He's like, I never, th I never thought about that. And I go, yeah. We've been trained not to think about that. We've been trained to submit and to surrender to poison, to things that corrupt whole neighborhoods, that, that, that hold people hostage, that project an image, that demands worship, that is satanic. I said, I'm not, I'm not into that no more. I used to be into that. I'm not into that. If I'm lifting my hands, it's to Jesus. That, you know, that's it. And there's nothing gay about that. That'll lead to abundant life. Not me pursuing an image that will only kill me or put me in jail. See, you, you have to really begin to think what is our culture full of and what is the message that they're speaking to us. And how, and how do we just embrace that message? If I want to stay married to one woman, why am I going to pump myself full of music that is satanic and that it dehumanizes women? It objectifies women and dehumanizes them. If I want to be a generous person who's prosperous, why am I going to listen to stuff, right, that is feeding greed and pride and arrogance? You, so you have, to, you have to eventually ask yourself, what, 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 how much do you think your diet is affecting your life? Right? That was all free. Nebuchadnezzar has a satanic longing in his heart to be worshipped. That comes from the pit of hell. That idea got Satan cast out of heaven. One day Satan's going to get cast out of the earth, and when we cast the devil out of someone, it's a witness that his days are numbered. That's why the devil hates, de he hates deliverance, he hates healing, he hates joy and he hates prosperity because he will never have any of that in the end. And he's stuck with himself forever and he's stuck with his choices. He's stuck with where pride got him. That's, what do you think about Pride Month? Pride got Satan thrown out of heaven. I don't celebrate no pride. My pride, any pride, I don't want no pride. I don't want pride will not deliver anything good to any of us. No form. And the worst pride is not even gay pride. The worst pride is spiritual pride when we think that we're better than other people because we're better off. Don't ever get confused for better off than better than. We may be better off than people, but we're not better than them, and we're here for them. And sometimes that's not easy, but nevertheless, that's the assignment. Now, this idea is the end of Nebuchadnezzar. People who demand honor don't deserve it. People who demand honor, I'm going to say this, do not deserve it. People who exalt themselves are putting themselves in a position they don't deserve and they know it. That's why they have to put themselves there. It's much better for God to bless you, for you to live with a clear conscience, instead of you having to exalt yourself because if it took the flesh to get you there it'll take the flesh to keep you there and the flesh only produces corruption so then ultimately it's going to lead to shame it's better to let God build it slow and solid and steady so that when God puts you there no one can remove you and people will try to remove you they will because favor triggers people Anyway, pride always leads to a fall. Here's what pride says. Pride is what tells us we should be further, faster. And it, it robs me of enjoying the beauty of this precious journey that I will never get to live again. I don't want to, I'm sick of being robbed. Like, we have been robbed a lot. Some of us robbed ourselves, held ourselves hostage. Visa tied us up, duct taped us to the chair. MasterCard is like, yo, shoo, let's duct tape me to the chair. Let, 
are, we have to get sick of getting played out and robbed by the enemy so that when we understand who, what is speaking to us, we don't give in to that voice. Because the devil, what did the devil tell Jesus? Bow down and worship me and I will give you the keys to the world. So if the devil is bold enough to, to tell the dude that threw him out of heaven <laughs> to worship me, you think the devil doesn't talk to you? You think the devil doesn't talk to me? But you know what I found out about the devil? If you don't listen to him, he leaves. The devil brings up people that, that, that hurt you, that you don't like, start praying for them and blessing them, the devil will go find someone else to harass. Oh Lord, bless that person. Let them serve you. Let the fear of the Lord come upon their life. That voice that tells you about that person, that voice will find someone else. Don't listen to that voice that tries to isolate you. Nobody understands you. Oh, you're all alone. You're the only one that goes through this. Everyone else has an easier journey than you. Look at all you've been through. Look. There's Christians today that are hunted. Hunted. Their wives raped. Their daughters taken. Uh, their churches bombed. Like, relatively speaking, like three or four billion people would trade places with you today, right now, and not look back. So, so this whole victim thing, nobody understands me, I'm all alone, I got... Listen, don't buy into that voice. That voice will bring, it will unleash hell in your family, in your mind, in your health. You listen to that voice, that voice will make you sick. I mean, physically sick. Don't think that your emotions and your physical condition are not, are not connected, because they are. The Bible says this, that envy rots the bones. There's a disease. What's that called? Cystic fiber? What's a disease that your bones rot? Does that someone know? Osteoporosis. See that? God bless the commission. <laughs> like 80% of the brain power right there. <laughs> God bless them. I'm like, what's that thing called? Envy will rot will rot the structure of your life see your bones are the structure we have to learn to celebrate each other that's very important we started celebrating on Friday night and we're celebrating all weekend this is a weekend of celebration I don't know what you're doing I'm celebrating I don't know what you're up to and if you, if you need to cry, I can cry with you too. I was crying 30 minutes ago. But after that, we're going to celebrate. Because God is good and God is faithful. And God is not going to forsake you and God is not going to leave you. So do not do the math without the grace of God in the equation. Don't do it. Don't do it. Even if it's a hard time, God will give you something in a hard time that you can't buy with money. And then once you have it, it's yours. Can no one tell me God is not faithful? No one can come and convince me nothing. They can I have seen with my eyes. <laughs> so anyway, the kingdom way, which is not easy, it's not, it's not the easy way. I will never say that to you. The kingdom way is lower and slower. It is humility and patience. It's the opposite of pride. This is humility month here. We're going to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord so that in due season, He can do a little Kairos moment for little old me and bless my life because I chose to humble myself. When we choose to humble ourselves, guess what we're choosing? Blessing, favor, increase. The opposite of how the world says you should get it. Everybody wants the same thing. It's like, everybody wants, you know, everybody wants the flow. It's how do we go about it? This is what pride will tell you. You shouldn't be here right now. You should be further. You should have more. You should be, and sometimes that is honestly true. Because we weren't good stewards and we were unwise. But here's how Thanksgiving works. I may not be where I want to be. 
I mean, I could say that, that that's a... I identify with that. What about you? I may not be where I want to be, but I'm not where I used to be, and I'm definitely not where I deserve to be. <laughs> How's that working out? People are like, you deserve more. You're so amazing. You deserve to go to hell. You've broken the law of God. You lived in rebellion against God. You knew God's word and you still violated it as a Christian. You, you, you deserve, we deserve to go to hell. You deserve more with the life. Sell vegan protein. I'm just joking with you. What's that herb life or whatever? You know, those marketing schemes are always, always appeal to the bankruptcy and people of you deserve more. <laughs> Interesting. When I talked to God and said, I need more, he said, I want you to give more. I said, I don't... <laughs> I don't think you're hearing me, Father. <laughs> the kingdom way is lower and slower. Humility and patience. Now, I'm going to tell you this. Neither one of these feel good. Now for me, patience feels even worse than humility. Because humility, you feel like, you know what? I want to tell someone some real stuff, but I'm going to shut up. And you feel good. You're like, you know what? I did the right thing. <laughs> uh, even though it hits the ego, smacks the ego. You know? Humility is like, yeah, it feels good. Even though it didn't feel good, but like three minutes later, you're like, it felt good. <laughs> It was a smart, but patience, you're like. <laughs> How long, oh Lord? What do I got to do, God? He's like, I don't think you're getting this. <laughs> this is not about you and what you can do. <laughs> like, I know you have some great ideas, you know, you're a pretty smart guy, you know, but that's not what this is about. You're actually learning to possess this little monster called you. <laughs> possess in patience we possess our soul so if I don't learn patience guess what I don't have rule over yourself, yourself. and what is yourself it's not this beautiful temple here <laughs> this overgrown temple yourself is your mind your will and your emotions now if I don't have rule over that guess what's gonna fly away my money Guess what else is going to fly away? Good relationships. Do you know with some people, you only bat once? You strike out, you never bat again. You dishonor them once, they will forgive you, and they will move on, and you'll try to send a text, and the text won't go through. They've forgiven you, but they won't mess with you. They'll say, God bless you, all the best to you, done. Do you know that I have never in 15 or 20 years seen, you have, uh, let's say I have a meltdown on Jose three times. I have never seen, once it crosses once or twice, I have never seen that relationship bring fruit in any area of my life once those lines are crossed. Never. Never once. Never. So, let me say something to you. Do not dishonor people that are trying to help you. And I'm not just talking about me. I'm saying if you have someone that's in your corner, even if they make you upset, don't dishonor them because that'll help you. All right, we're going to get off that. We've got to get back to Nebuchadnezzar here. So at the time when all of the people heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the symphony, with all kinds of music, all the people, nations, and languages fell down, worshipped the gold image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Everyone is doing it. It's easier to go with the flow. It's easier to move with the crowd. Watch what happens. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. They spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, and the psaltery and symphony with all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews 
whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, have not paid due regards to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. So here what's happening is, number one, the music is preceding the worship. We went over that. When you hear the sound, bow down. This is so applicable to us today. Listen, when they want to sell you drugs, when you're watching TV and you don't have a premium account, that's painful. Have you ever been in that stage in your life where you don't have the premium account? Okay. <laughs> well, what that does is that wastes your time. I'm going to give you something so free. This will change your life. You want to have a more peaceful life? Anyone? Press mute for those 59 seconds. And don't allow those sounds into yourself. Watch how much better you feel. You know the commercials? You know that every time they want to sell you drugs? Are you guys alive? Nope. Do you guys have Paramount? Do you? Someone? All right. When they, they are trying, when they are trying to sell you drugs, like legal drugs, oh, like prescription. prescription drugs, right? There's always music with it. Happy, Happy music. They got HIV. They're like, <laughs> like yeah, at the risk of a heart attack, suicide, your arm falling off, and you wanting to kill your children and eat your dog, we'll give you this medicine. And there's a little jingle in music. Do you have to understand that that is used to program you? You have to be careful with that. <laughs> so anyway, the people that Daniel saved are now wanting to kill his friends. Daniel was saying, yo, don't kill, don't kill the wise men, the astrologers, and all the demonic people. Even the demonic people were doing better when Daniel was there. That's <laughs> like, Daniel looked out for them and they did not look out for his friends. This is exactly what it's like because in the kingdom we love folks but often don't get love back. Keep loving people. Keep loving people. We don't love people for results because we are not hoes. Is that all right? Yeah. We're Christians. We just love people because God loved us. I don't got to agree with you to love you. I don't got to vote like you to love you. I, I can just love you. Even if you don't love me, I love you. Because how you act does not control me. And your words and my feelings, they're not on the same server. I may observe them, but I'm not importing them. Be careful because people will try to speak into your life to corrupt your heart especially about meaningful relationships. I will never in my life ever trade my relationship with my pastor with some disgruntled sheep. Watch what you listen to. Be very careful what you listen to. So anyway, it seems that in Daniel 3a is showing us that this was ethnically motivated, these Jews who you put in place. So now you have Jewish people with favor in Babylon. The Jews always go into favor. They made, a, they made a statement. I was watching this Jewish guy talk, and he said, more than us keeping the Sabbath, the Sabbath has kept us. You wonder why Jewish people are prosperous? Because they give and they rest. <laughs> Bless you. Anyway, when you see religion, politics, and ethnicity come together, get ready. They're trying to do it in America right now. They're trying to make Trump a religion. Joe Biden is a religion. Pride is a religion. When that ethnicity and, 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 and when, when all of that, that the politics and religion and ethnicity, when that comes together, that creates a satanic trinity of death that unleashes hell on earth. This is what Nebuchadnezzar, it's religious, it's political, and it's ethnic. And three guys wind up in a fire. So the devil longs for worship and bloodshed. This, we have to be careful that we do not allow the unrest of our society to get into our spirit.
There's a movie right now called Civil War. It's on Apple and all the other places where you watch movies, Amazon, and they are trying to sow discord. But can I tell you something? There's nothing civil about a war. <laughs> you ever think about that? Have you ever thought about that? The Civil War. No, there was nothing civil about the North fighting the South. There's nothing civil about killing women and children and raping people and dropping bombs. There's nothing civil about that. And it doesn't ever really make anything better. It usually makes everything worse, actually. So unless someone is absolute evil like Hitler and he stopped, 99% of the time it doesn't do anything. I'll give you an example. We went into Iraq. There was no war in Iraq. The war was in Afghanistan. We destabilized Iraq. We left Iraq. That created a vacuum for ISIS. The very thing that America did in Iraq, Israel is doing in Palestine. I'm not anti-Semitic. I'm not anti-Palestine. I'm, I'm pro-human. I'm pro-life. I'm anti-war unless it's to stop people from harming innocent people. I hate violence. Our culture is addicted to violence. We, we watch men and women fight and we love it, which, which is a medication for our own anger. When you don't have anger in your heart in your life, you don't like to watch someone punch someone in the face. When, when I was young, I said if someone scars my face, I will body them. I will murder someone. This is what I said to myself. If I ever have a scar in my face, I will murder someone. Do you understand? And then when I became a Christian, God said, you better repent of that spirit of murder and death. So we are, our culture, whether we acknowledge it or not, we're addicted to greed and violence. And as kingdom people, we have to take a step back and observe and go, mm, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. I don't know about beating your face in in the name of Jesus. I don't know about that. I mean, if you do that, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. But for me, it's, it's difficult to see God in me trying to physically break someone. I don't see that. Did you know that the early Christians were the ones that stopped the circus? Did you know that? Yeah, you don't know that. Because the world tells you that the church is bad and the white guy's bad and everyone's bad. And, but actually, the church were the ones that stopped the Roman circus and the gladiators. The gladiators were stopped by the church because it was dehumanizing and wicked. I know I'm touching a cultural demon here with, with the music and the fighting, but I don't care because I'm not here to make friends, win friends, and influence people. I'm not going to tell you something is good for you if it will poison you. Now, Therefore, at a certain time, the Chaldeans came forward. Okay, we got past that. Now, and worship, and whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning fire. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province. Okay, we're in 13. Let me go. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and in fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, it is true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you should not serve my gods, the gold image which I have set up. Now, if you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, psaltery, and symphony, with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the image which I made good. But if you do not worship it, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Now he crossed the line. He crossed the line right there. Keep God's name out your mouth. <laughs> Listen. When you, when you harm innocent people <clears throat> or you challenge God, watch out. What, what, what happened to the president of Iran? Hello? Are you alive? Do you know what happened? The, one of the, one, a rich, powerful country 
you know, with the army and, and everything, they can't even keep a helicopter in the air. You put your trust in that? They can't even keep a helicopter in the air. Watch out. You know what he was speaking? Death. Research it. Go research it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. <laughs> if that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, but if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. This needs to be the war cry of our generation, that we will not bow down. Our God can deliver and will deliver. And even if he does it, we are not going to bow down. Amen. We now they have every reason to say, man, you know, I, I was a young kid. I had family. Now I've been taken captive. I've probably been castrated. I'm a slave. I'm I, you know, I've been taken from my land. Man, forget God. It seems that God forgot me. I'm not going to serve God. Look at me. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an exile. I'm not serving God. They had every right in the natural to be bitter. But bitter people never do nothing. Bitter people never do nothing. They do, I have never met one bitter person that I said, man, I want to be like you when I grow up. They said, no, you have a victim mentality. You will never do anything and anything that you have, eventually you'll lose. Because you're a victim. That's what victims do. You'll victimize yourself. They said, no. We're not worshiping your God. We're going to be faithful even in an unfavorable situation. And when the pressure is on, we are not bowing down. You know what this is? This is civil disobedience. The Bible is full of the doctrine of civil disobedience. You had no problem disobeying when you were heathen. Oh, at the police, man. You had no problem breaking every law. Oh, they want me to stay home and wear a mask. I think I'll do it. I want to love my neighbor. I don't want... Come on. Listen. Your faith is going to bring you into a place where civil disobedience will be a requirement. God says, I want you to go to China. Bring Bibles into China. Well, that's not really <laughs> what they want in China. That's what I'm telling you to do. Are you, are you getting me? Then, I'm going through customs. And the Lord says, I want you to give a Bible to the customs agent. If you don't, nobody will. Civil disobedience. I am not going to obey you. I'm not a prisoner of my house. I'm not staying home. I'm not on house arrest. I'm a free person. We're free to come to church. You're free not to come to church. <laughs> You're free to wear a mask. You're free not to wear a mask. That's how freedom works. You're free to make an informed choice and we love you no matter what. But they want to, they want the spirit of the age wants to control and coerce and use fear to manipulate you, but it's really about worship and service. 
That's what this is about. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury. Self-absorbed, selfish, insecure people's first reaction when someone opposes them is anger. God is going to bring him low. He doesn't even know. He's about to get crushed. God is about to teach him, I, Yahweh, am the one who sets up kings and takes them down. Wait till next week. Oh, he's going to learn. He's going to become quotable. He's going to learn such a painful lesson. Next week, we're going to quote Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> Imagine God teaching the devil a lesson. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury and the expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Tell someone no. See how that goes. Practice with your kids. You better learn to teach your kids no or you're not going to parent them well. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was heated more than it was usually heated, and he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning furnace. Then these men were, in, were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their other garments and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego." His anger, guess who his anger affected the worst? The people who were closest to him. God, deliver us from anger. When I get angry, guess who pays? Sarah and the kids. I know you probably think I don't get angry. But I can get angry. And it's not good. I actually have a calmer. It's better and it's in my best interest to not cross a certain threshold. Um, and so I just, you have to self-regulate. It's called self-control. You have to feel yourself, you know, heating up and say, because you could lose your testimony like that. And some people are, are not normal. Like they have a, they, they went somewhere before. And if they don't like, like calm that down, they could do something that's not, that really will in life, I'm going to tell you this, you could really, especially nowadays, because everyone's an MMA fighter, everyone's going to the UFC, you could really mouth off to the wrong dude who's 5'7 and 160 pounds, and he could unleash hell on you, and, and you, you, you didn't see it coming. That's the type of society we live in. Everyone, everyone is now, you know, a fighter now and stuff like that. But you have to really self-regulate because without self-control, all of us will self-destruct. And whatever you don't manage, you'll lose. So this guy, he's all angry and stuff. And his anger costs the people closest to him something. They are trying to kill Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Guess who dies? Them. And these are his mighty men of valor. So like David had mighty men. Do you remember that? These are Nebuchadnezzar's mighty men. Think of these as his secret service detail. Got the little piece, black suit. They will body you <laughs> quickly. And they can't even keep themselves out of a fire. <laughs> the most powerful guys that the most powerful man on earth had around him cannot even keep themselves out of a fire. This guy can't even sleep at night. Listen, the world has nothing for you. If, if you still think the world has something for you, you're not ready to serve the purposes of the kingdom. You, you have to really know that doing things the world's way really will cost you. He's, he loses his best men. In trying to get rid of innocent people, he loses his best men. Those that were surrounding him, closest to him, his detail. That's what anger does. Anger will cost you the best people in your life. Anger will push away the best people for you. We have to really ask the Lord to deliver us from anger. And we hold on to anger because it makes us feel safe. 
It's like this little bat under your seat. You got that little bat, you feel all right. You know about that bat. Some of you know what that bat is. Not gonna say anything about that bat. But uh, Joseph got one. I got one in my bedroom. So you know, but, but that bat, that anger, that's not gonna serve you. That'll actually hurt you. So anyway, I don't wanna see you like that, just so you know. Now, let's continue. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste, and saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound? into the midst of the fire they answered and said to the king true O king look he answered I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt and the form of the fourth is like the son of God listen he threw them in bound they were free he threw three and there was four you know what God is doing Nebuchadnezzar you think you're in control. No, no. You're not in control. I'm in charge. And when I want to do something, you cannot prohibit me because I am the Lord of heaven and earth. See, and, and there, are, there are things that we think we can do this and do that, but there's moments where God breaks in. And now, this is going to be the beginning of the end of Nebuchadnezzar. Who is the God, he said, that can deliver you from my hands? Now he's challenging God. Go on YouTube and find videos of people mocking God. You will see the most wild stuff on camera in real life. Don't mock God. God will not be mocked. In your anger, don't mock God. It, it, watch, watch the words that come out of your mouth, especially when you're angry. When you feel anger, pray about it. Say, Lord, I'm angry. Here's why I'm angry. I feel justified in my anger, but help it not to have dominion over me. I'm not going to sleep angry. Ask the Lord to help you with that. Now, worship is about serving. King Nebuchadnezzar wanted to be worshipped, and he wanted them to serve him, but that's not what he was. They were, they were there to do. Now, in the second commandment, in Exodus 20 is about this very thing. And these guys are like, nope, we're not doing it. I don't know about you. I would rather stand with three men who have courage than 10,000 men who have fear. I would rather have dinner with people who are overcomers than listen and sit with complainers. The whole conversation is different. <laughs> Like one is life giving, the other one is draining. One adds to you, the other takes from you. You, you know, you have to really watch out. <laughs> now, then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning furnace and spoke Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from the midst of the fire, and the satraps, administrators, governors, and the king's counselors gathered together, and they saw these men on whom the bodies of the fire had no power. Say, no power. No power. No power. The word there is rule. You know what he's teaching them about? Kingdom. No rule. You know, they tried to burn John the Revelator in oil twice. Couldn't burn him. That's why they sent him to Patmos. There are times when God steps in and goes, no, no. You can't. I am. He's teaching them about his kingdom. Watch this. And they saw these men in whose the bodies, the fire had no power, nor, nor the hair of their head was not singed, nor their garments were affected, and the smell of the fire was not on them. You don't have to wear what you're walking through. Mm -hmm. 
there are people that you meet that you have no idea what they've been through and what they're going through because they're kingdom. And they don't smell it like. They don't smell like fire. It doesn't mean they haven't been in fire. Don't get that confused. <laughs> don't you ever get that? Listen. <laughs> okay. Let's continue. Remember I say it? And they will walk through the fire and it shall not be. Nebuchadnezzar spoke saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word. When you say no to people, guess what you do? When we say no to ourselves, guess who we frustrate? <laughs> it's all right. You got to learn to say no to yourself. You don't say no to yourself, it'll cost you your marriage. It'll cost you your home. It'll cost you your kids. Your kids will hate you eventually. You have to learn how to say no to yourself. So they said no. Let me continue. You have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own. Nebuchadnezzar is getting schooled by three young Hebrew boys. The youth group is schooling a world ruler. No, no, I'm serious. These were young boys. Like, we would go like, like adolescent boys. The voice is cracking. Ooh. Like, they are, the youth group is schooling a world leader. When you, when you submit your life to, to the Lord, you become an instrument in the hand of God to teach powerful people lessons. They, he thinks that he's the most powerful guy. He's not. He's about to be brought low. Watch. Therefore, I will make, I'm, I, therefore I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made an ash heap because there is no other God who can deliver like this. Uncompromising devotion is what manifests the kingdom of God. Compromise will never deliver what it promises. People say, oh, let's do this little compromise here and, and we'll be happy. No, you can never make someone happy who needs you to be happy. If you need me to be happy, you'll never be happy. Happiness is an inside job. Zoe has taught us, it's your choice to rejoice. Zoe, you, you, cho you choose to rejoice. That's your choice, not my choice. So if people try to put their feelings on you, that's a form of manipulation. Don't let people manipulate you. You're making me feel a certain type of way. No, I don't have the power to do that. That's your choice. Don't let people use words to manipulate you. You have to be really careful because the devil will really try to, you know. This is... This here needs to be like our war cry. And when I say war cry, I don't mean with bullets and knives. I'm talking about as kingdom people. We are not going to bow down. Our God can deliver, will deliver, and if he doesn't deliver, I'll take a martyr's crown. Do you know, you know what this means? We win no matter what. Do you realize that? Okay, you kill a Christian, you're putting them in the presence of Jesus where there's no more sadness, death, and tears. Thank you. <laughs> no more taxes and tithes. No more, you know, i got feeling problems. No more, can you help me with my life because I don't read my Bible. No. <laughs> Think about that. A Christian win. I mean, a real Christian. You know we win. We're unstoppable. A real Christian. They kill you. Man, you, 
<laughs> it's over, bro. All the pain, all the sorrow, all the tears, all the tax bills, my Lord. It's all like, so even if they get burned and die, they win. That's, this is powerful. The, the Christian, this is why death has lost its sting. You know, my mom died and stuff. We're all crying. Like, oh, we miss her. She's like, <laughs> those God forsaken people can't bother me anymore. <laughs> She's free. Death has lost its sting. <laughs> ah, all right. Guess who paid for the king's anger? We went through all that. <laughs> Here it comes. The Hebrew boy stood for God and God stood with them. Stand for God. We don't stand for God in our own strength. I don't possess the power in myself to stand for God. That's one of the elementary lessons that Simon had to learn to become Peter. You don't serve God in your own strength. You don't stand for God in your own strength. Your strength is not enough. My strength is not enough. It's not in our strength. It's His strength. It's not by might and it's not by power. It's by His Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. It's, it's not us. It's Him. Now, it was the Son of God who was with them in the fire. Now, where did Jehoiakim throw the scroll? Come on, someone. In the, thank you. Somebody read their Bible. So Jehoiakim, the nasty king, gets mad. They to tell him something he doesn't want to hear. And so what does he do? He takes a scroll and he throws it in the fire. Guess where Jesus shows up? In the fire again. Can't get rid of Jesus. <laughs> Can't get rid of him. He shows up. He shows up for people who stand up. He shows up for people who stand up. God is telling us to stand up. To plant your feet and stand. That's what Paul wrote about. Stand. That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And having done all to stand, stand. You should read a book by Watchman Nee called Stand. Sit, walk, stand. That's someone who's in prison 20 years. He stood. You have to learn how to stand against the stuff that is coming against us. It, it's, it's critical. Now, the gospel is shouting at us from the book of Daniel. It is Jesus who saves us from the fire. Daniel 3. And in Daniel 6, in just a few weeks, it is Jesus who saves us from the lion's mouth, which is a picture of Satan, who is not a lion, He's like a roaring lion. He's not a lion. There's only one lion. That's the lion of the tribe of Judah. But he is like a, ro a lion, a roaring lion. He's like. The enemy is like a shadow. You're a young kid and you're in your room. And you see someone walking by your house. And you see a shadow and you feel afraid. The enemy is not the person outside. The enemy is like that shadow. He casts darkness, but he doesn't have power over people that have spiritual authority. I wouldn't focus on the devil. You got, a, you got a bigger chance of screwing your life up than the devil does. If your life is submitted to the Lord, the devil is not going to want to hang around with you. Now, he'll try to come and tempt you. Oh, yeah, but he's not going to want to camper out around you because you can see him. You expose him. And then you confront him, and then that doesn't go well. And people either get free or they get gone. When the devil, when, when, when we confront people, right, and it's for their good, people have a choice. The same with me. When, when God confronts me, I have a choice to, to let God deal with me or to say, oh, I'm okay. But we're not okay. If we were okay, God wouldn't address us. God wouldn't speak to us. God wouldn't correct us. But since he loves us, he does. <clears throat> now, the enemy is after your worship. Plain and simple. Plain and simple.
The enemy is after your testimony because as your worship, so goes your testimony. For example, what is worship? Worship is not just songs, me singing back to Isaac and Deborah with a broken down off key voice. No, that's not worship. Worship is when my heart is submitted and surrendered to God. Worship is surrender. Worship is not singing. Singing is an expression of surrender. But, but that, that's worship. That's what the enemy is after. Because whatever we worship, we serve. Think of the music. Think of the value system that we came from, some of us. Think of the mentalities. Think of the language. Think of the behavior. Whatever you worship, you serve. And whatever you serve, you worship. That's why Christians that don't serve, what is it they're worshiping? A Christian that doesn't want to serve people? I'm not saying you have to be, you know, a pastor or, you know, but if you don't, if your heart is not to love Jesus and to love people, what, what Jesus, this is not the Jesus of the Bible. Jesus is not our genie in a bottle to make our life easier and stuff like that. Yes, he wants to help us, but it's about loving him and loving people. And your life will be greatly enriched with those mentalities because you will be around people like that. The thing that I learned about like-minded people, you can't keep them apart. People who have a shared experience and a, shame, a shared view, you cannot bring division between Mac and I. You cannot call me and tell me bad things about Mac and think that it'll get any airtime. You cannot call Mac about me. You, it will get no airtime. It won't even get entertained. You, 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 like-hearted people, like-minded people, you can't keep them apart. That's why the, the real church is organic. You don't, it doesn't have to be forced. That's why we sometimes just wait until it's in someone's heart and they go, I would like to serve. Awesome. I'm not looking for volunteers. This is not, hey, welcome home. Let's get more volunteers. We, God didn't tell us to build volunteers. God told us to build disciples. That's a whole different ballgame. Standard is way different. <laughs> you will not be promoted through compromise. Get that out of your head. You will be promoted through pure service. Now, purity is what leads to promotion. Now, in the world, women, they got to sleep with their boss. Now it's so crazy, it's dudes. Now it's so wild. <laughs> the world has gone mad. I gotta change the metaphor. It's so crazy. It's like dudes sleeping with dudes to become rappers. Yeah, that's that's crazy. But that's about worship and service. But in the kingdom, that's not how promotion comes. In in the kingdom, promotion comes through purity. The opposite of the world. The world will turn you out, thug you out, and then promote you. That's not the kingdom. It's the opposite. God will say, no, I'm going to put you on a shelf. Oh, you think you're powerful? No, no. I'm going to help you sleep at night. I'm going to give you self-control. I'm going to deal with your anger. I'm going to deal with your selfish ambition. I'm going to deal with your, I'm going to deal with these things in your life so you're healed and whole and healthy so that the life of God can flow through you to bless people. I'm going to give you power over yourself so that when I bless your life, you won't curse yourself with your choices. And, and so then what does God do? God puts us aside and the potter begins to work on the vessel. The potter begins to form the vessel. That's okay. And then anyone who has this hope in him does what? Purifies himself as he is pure. So if you want to serve the purposes of God, we want to move toward purity, not toward how much of the world can I embrace and keep my salvation. Because that's, that is what really... The, the, the spirit of the age within the church is how worldly can I be and not lose my salvation and my house? <laughs> it's like, 
<laughs> you know, because you start saying you're going to start losing everyone, everyone's behaving. People, everyone behaving when, when the threat of losing, you know, then everyone is like, you know, they get serious and stuff. But anyway, last one. This is my, my heart for you. And you have been hostage today. I want to verbalize that. So anyway, the king promoted them. The guy that wanted to throw, the guy, not wanted, the guy that had them thrown in the fire is the one that promoted them. They instructed him about the kingdom through not compromising. And it triggered him and made him angry. When a control freak realizes they're not in control, freaks them out. When you, for little kids, when you redirect a little kid, like they want to go in one direction, you go, no, we're going to go here. They go, ah! they go crazy. And little kids are the best picture of what we're really like, if we're honest. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I'm watching my kid have a meltdown, and I'm like, wow. That looks awful like my feelings inside my head. <laughs> you know, like, you know, she's like, anyway. So the king that wanted to kill them, that tried to kill them, actually winded up promoting them. And the word promote is advance, prosper, thrive. Can I say something to us in a nice way? We are not known for thriving. There's very few people that I can look at and go, wow, they're thriving. I don't look at myself in the mirror and go, man, you are just thriving. It's like, it's like, wow, capital T-H-R-I-V, thrive. You are, you know, you should start your own, like, coaching network. You could thrive like me. I, we are not known as thriving people. That has to change. Nothing is more powerful than a testimony. Nothing. Because at the end of the day, you can't fight a testimony. People live in a testimony. Drive a testimony, wear a testimony, they're living with their health because of a testimony. What are you going to tell someone? You, they'll laugh at you. So the king promoted them, he advanced them, he, they prospered, thrived to make progress. This is, can I tell you this? This is important. This word right here is a very important word for your life. I'm going to close my Bible. If you're done before I am, you can leave. No hard feelings. But I want to spend like two minutes on this word. This word is a very important word for your health. Everyone loves mental health now. I'm taking a mental health day. No, you got sick and you're going to sleep because you're running your body down to, to the ground. You know, like... So... Progress can be measured. Progress. In, in other words, you were here, but now you're here. You would have responded like this, but now you respond like that. You spent time with these people doing that with your free time, but now you're doing this. You used to view women in this way and now you're viewing them that way. You used to view money as this, but now you're doing that. You have to see in your own life the progress that you've made. Some of you have made a lot of progress in a short time. Some of you have made a little progress in a long time. We're not going to put a list of those people's names up. <laughs> Fred wants to do it. I'm not doing that to people. But, but my point is, this sim is a simple thing that you have to know that you have made some progress and you have to track the progress. Right? When you, when you get your direct deposit, maybe you save a little money, invest a little money, you're able to, you ever see a chart that goes like this? How does that feel when you look at that chart? Do you like that chart? It's the only me that likes that chart. Right? You, you see you're making progress now you uh, the other way you have debt you're paying debt 
you're, you're making progress. You're reading the Word consistently. You're making progress. God is instructing you and showing you lessons that are priceless. You're making progress. You have to see the progress in your life. You have to, one of the reasons I journal is to help me understand the process and to see the progress. God wants you to be thankful for the process and the progress because you're, you're, we're, 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 you're walking, you're, you're, you know, you're making progress. It's good, but you have to stop and sometimes celebrate that. You know people really struggle to celebrate? People struggle to celebrate. It's so possible that we could win and God can do something and we miss the moment of celebration. And I, I would like to just instruct you, don't spike the ball before you're in the end zone. But make sure you learn to celebrate the progress that you've made in your life. Because your father does. And he wants to celebrate with you. When the son came home, what was his first response? It wasn't like a re-entry plan. I would be like, here's how this is going to work. <laughs> like, you can't drive my car until you take a piss test. You know, like, you're not getting in my car, bro. Like, the, but the father was present in the moment and he celebrated the return of his son. All right, we're done. Lord, help us to celebrate you by celebrating what you have done in our lives. Lord, help us to live without compromise and to celebrate what you're doing. Even if it's hard to see, what, what is it that we should celebrate? Like, in the midst of a struggle, yet you have brought us forward and you are moving in the life of your people. And so, Lord, I ask you to give us this grace to celebrate. We have new lives coming forth. We have new marriages. There's new ministries, Lord. Help us to be a people of celebration. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.